Joining me now at the GEPF Thought Leadership Conference, day two, Daniel Manele, head of the Presidential Climate Finance Task Team of South Africa. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Daniel, so you've just come off stage with your keynote address on climate change and the transition to a green economy. What does climate change mean and the changes that the South African economy and the global economy is going through? What does it mean for investment um, in infrastructure? Look, as I said um, earlier on in the address, um, climate change and the risks uh, to the climate in the way they're changing uh, our environment is probably the largest, it's arguably the most challenging issue uh, that we have to deal with today. It has got risks that we need to manage, be the harvest opportunity, um, the uh, global warming uh, and the way in which we've been managing resources and how we've been relying on highly carbon sort of intensive uh, measures uh, for development path is no longer sustainable. Um, we need to transition to more sustainable uh, resources of energy. We need to uh, transition to a low carbon economy and more climate resilient society. And some of the issues that we've been observing around the world, which as I indicated, makes us recognize that this is not a future problem. These are lived realities today. If we look at the floods that we saw in KwaZulu-Natal and the end parts of the Eastern Cape, what people have experiencing in Pakistan, the kind of temperature uh, levels that one experienced in the most recent European summer. So this is a real burning issue which required urgent action. But to transition uh, the economy into a greener future requires an integrated and a holistic way of approaching this and huge public and private sector investments in sustainable infrastructure in, in sustainable renewable energy is required to transition us and that is how we essentially secure our future so, and the future for future generations. So Daniel, then what developments have taken place locally to ensure that South Africa on its path toward renewable energy follows a just transition without impacting the livelihoods of the people that are employed in fossil fuel energy sectors? Look, the just transition entails uh, uh, quite simply making sure uh, that those workers and those communities that are highly dependent on the fossil fuel value chain are protected through the transition in the short term, uh, probably through safety nets and just making sure that uh, we protect them from their impacts, but further out and longer term to make sure that we secure their futures, that we have new livelihoods for them, that they're trained, that they're reskilled, and that as and when we uh, decommission a coal-fired power plants and repurpose them, that there's a commensurate uh, skills uh, development program, that there is a diversification of our economic structure, that the new uh, sectors of the economy that are more sustainable and compatible with a, uh, a greener future are developed and, and, and through that uh, we manage to secure people's livelihoods. So it's, it's a whole combination of issues uh, around protection but also securing their futures and making sure that the risks, the challenges, the opportunities, the benefits that come with transitions are shared in a manner that is equitable and that is fair. Absolutely. But Daniel, what role would the private sector play in this transition toward a more sustainable future? The role of the private sector is quite crucial. Uh, this transition all stands and falls with resources, with finance uh, to underpin this transition and the public sector resources are simply insufficient uh, given the, the need of the investments and the scale uh, at which the, these investments are required. So this is not just a unique South African uh, problem. And in fact, the, um, Mr. Mark Carney, who used to be the, the former governor of the, of the Bank of England and is, a, is the UN so climate envoy, has put it quite aptly and just said that you need the private sector billions to trigger the private, uh, you need the public sector billions to trigger the private sector trillions. So in deploying funds that the public sector is making available for this transition, they need to be deployed in such a manner that they can leverage the actually much bigger pools 
of funds that reside in the domestic and in the international private sector markets. And in a way, this comes at a time which is quite conducive mm. uh, because it's at the time when issues such as ESG approaches are being driven quite strongly by shareholders, by other stakeholders, institutional investors, rating agencies, right up to regulators. Uh, so there is actually, there are pools of funds that need to find uh, a green investments that need to decarbonize. Banks need to make sure that their loan books uh, are, are decarbonized. So there, there is actually a confluence of factors where there is money available uh, which needs to be deployed into this green economy. So it's how we structure it for maximum impact. Daniel, is there an option for South Africa or perhaps the global economy to fail at achieving a, a sustainable future? I mean, these are future generations that we're talking about. And what, what is your outlook if we actually get this right? Now, if we do get it right, it will be usually impactful. And as you say, it will secure uh, the future of generations that, that come after us. And quite frankly, there is really no option. As I said to you, the actual impacts of the vagaries of climate change, of not being able to limit on a global scale in line with all of our commitments, and the greenhouse gas emissions, um, is, is a, a, an intensification of some of the impacts that we've seen now. Storms, regular fires, and the, uh, the very devastating sort of environmental impacts that we are seeing, which will very directly uh, threaten our livelihoods. And, and I talked to these rising temperatures that we're just going to feel. And, and I think more and more, given what we have seen, is that there is a very clear realization. We've gone way beyond times when potentially people were in denialism and thinking, oh, these are just sort of long-term climatic changes that happen. Um, and so we shouldn't panic about them. And I think now there's a realization that we need to respond. It's a global challenge that requires global uh, cooperation. And there's an urgency to respond, given that the impacts and the dire consequences we live through every day. Daniel, thank you very much for your insights. We appreciate your time. Thank you.